This is episode 5 of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A. J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. That's gorilla with two R's and two L's. To support this project and get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash sajjohnson. If you've gotten this far, I hope you're enjoying it, so take a minute to tell a friend. If you've already done that, please consider leaving this podcast a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And thanks. This podcast contains fleeting explicit language. Chapter 9, The Classes, Fall 2014. Welcome back to Anthropology 3274, the post-fossil fuel world. Brett stood in front of 55 students in the lecture hall. Note, a special note of thanks goes to Brett Gustafson, Glenn Stone, and Jeff Childs at Washington University in St. Louis. I have borrowed liberally from their courses on fossil fuels, agriculture, and population dynamics, respectively. In this chapter, I mine the syllabus of Brett's class for many of the articles and books cited as part of the story's course. The conclusions and arguments, however, are my own, and they should not be blamed for any overstatement or mischaracterization on my part. End of note. I hope you all had a relaxing Thanksgiving break, but I have been excited to get back to our discussion. Throughout the course of this semester, it has become obvious that we have two factions developing here, so much so that you've split the classroom down the middle. Now, if I have this straight on this side, he gestured to his left, are the optimists who think we'll continue to innovate our way out of the coming fossil fuel crisis. And you here, Brett turned to the right, are the doomsday preppers. The undergraduates snickered, but in the back, two heads shook from side to side. I see we have an objection already. All right, Eric and Eva, let's hear your version of things. Students turned around their seats, peering at the two in the back row. Eva and Eric had completed their PhDs, but were sitting in on Brett's class because of the topic. They were responsible for the split in the class. Brett fell into the optimistic camp, and they were the voice of the opposition. Eric spoke first. We're realistic. It's only doomsday if you're tied to a single way of life. Eva nodded. If you think our grandchildren will be living in some futuristic continuation of our current system, you'll do whatever you can to perpetuate the status quo and consider anything less a failure. And I think it's clear that this way of life cannot continue without a massive overhaul, at which point it becomes a new way of life. We're not pessimistic. We're hoping to see the bright new future in our lifetimes. Eva stood, pointing at Brett and the optimist. If you cling to the past and the present, you can't get on board with the solutions we need to survive. Propping up this fossil fuel-dependent world puts us on track for a Mad Max future where a powerful few hoard all the resources. We want the majority to take over the reins now, while we still have time to build a sustainable infrastructure. Eric spread his hands, palms up. So we're the realists on this side, and you're over there living in the past. At least we agree that we're facing a crisis. Most of society appears to be willfully ignorant of that fact. Brett sensed another rant beginning. All right, all right. Let's say you two are teaching this course. Would you frame it so differently than I have? Would you subject the students to worse readings than I've dug up? The class tittered. Brett agonized over the readings, and the students could tell. They started at the obvious, working through articles describing the pervasiveness of fossil fuels in American society, including Laura Nader's Barriers to Thinking New About Energy and John Uri and Mimi Scheller's Look at the American Love Affair with the Car. Next came an examination of the sources of fossil fuels, from Canadian tar sands in the Middle Eastern oil to coal and fracking in the U.S. They read Timothy Mitchell's book, Carbon Democracy, watched the film version of Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything, and worked through articles linking our economic system to the use of fossil fuels and war. Note, Nader, 1981, Scheller, 2004, Uri, 2004, Goodell, 2010, Junrod, 2010, Klein, 2014. The Billion and El Khatib, 2004. Mayer, 2010. Mitchell, 2013. Zalik, 2004. And 2011. End of note. The first half of the course was easy because problems with fossil fuel dependence were obvious. Now they were supposed to concentrate on solutions. Brett knew that real answers were unrealistic. Either the public would be rabid about regulations or half measures would fail to ensure a future for people. If a solution existed, it would have been implemented already. His plan for the rest of the semester had been to discuss technological solutions to the energy crisis, but he worried that the class's schism would make this impossible. Instead of debating the merits of wind, solar, nuclear, geothermal, and hydropower, he would have to defend the use of electricity itself. Over the break, he had decided to start playing offense with these Luddites and had come up with a way to do it. How about this? For the rest of the term, we'll be discussing solutions. Brett pointed at Eric and Eva. Why don't you two come up with a reading list for your point of view? I'll cut my readings in half, and you can fill it in with whatever you want. Then we'll have an informed debate. The two glanced at one another and responded in unison. Deal. 
That afternoon, Eric headed to Eva's office to choose their readings. Her third floor office was on the top level of their building. The air temperatures rose as he climbed the stairs. The building's boiler had been started over the break, and the radiators pumped out enough heat to keep the building toasty in the middle of winter, but in the late fall and early spring, the officers were sweltering. He saw her open window as he knocked on the door and entered. Disgusting waste, isn't it? Eva pointed with her thumb at the window behind her. Too hot for most of the winter, and then they crank up the air conditioner so high in the summer that I need to wear a sweater. I hate wasting this heat, but I can't take off any more clothes. Eric smiled and took a seat across from Eva. Yeah, I'm going to be in my t-shirt before long. So do you think we got under Brett's skin, or is he genuinely interested in a dialogue? Probably a little of both. I'm excited, though. At least he didn't just shut us down again. Me too. I've been going over a list of unimpeachable readings in my mind. Unimpeachable? Yeah, you know, writings from well-respected folks who have given rise to our point of view. Oh, sure, like Thoreau and Muir. Right, I think those are where we should start. Maybe we should pull some less relevant passes from Walden. Like the part with the Irish guy that lives near him? The one who works himself to the bone to buy small luxuries? Uh Uh-huh. And the bits about wastefulness of clothing and the pursuit of wealth? It boggles my mind to think how right he was about clothing, even though it was just starting to be mass-produced. I think he'd be staggered to see today's clothing economy. Should we pull from his civil disobedience stuff? I think it's less relevant to this discussion, don't you? I guess it depends where you think we're headed with this. Eric's eyes had been wandering over the maps, vintage political posters, and tacked up photos on the wall but he snapped back to attention now. What do you mean? Correct me if I'm wrong, but we're advocating for a vastly different way of life than our current one. Well, of course, since the cessation of fossil fuels would change everything. And you think most people would just go along quietly? Eric paused. No, I don't think they would. That's why Thoreau's civil disobedience writings are relevant. Ah, okay, I see your point. And of course you're right. So maybe let's stick that at the end. First, we have to convince the class that a fossil fuel sustained life is illogical. Once we do that, we can introduce a real solution. A revolution in the living? Exactly. All right, Eva said. What about Muir? Uh, I think we pull from his Yosemite journals and writings on civilization. Okay, I agree. Uh, If you'll do Thoreau, I can pull out some Muir readings. I have copies of most of his stuff. Uh, Who's next? Eric had pulled out a notebook and was scribbling. Why not a deeper dive into folks like Aldo Leopold and Arnie Nass? Oh right, we can pick through Leopold's almanac and other writings about the land ethic he developed. And Nass really builds on the critique of anthropocentrism, which we can introduce with Leopold and then flesh out with Nass. That will lead us into the deep ecology movement and we can find plenty of recent stuff to read. Eva swiveled in her chair and started leafing through her bookshelf. I've got most of NASA's writings and the Deep Ecology anthologies. I can pull out a few things. For sure, we should go over their platform, the apron diagram, and maybe even create our own eco-sophie as a class project. Ooh, that could be fun. Maybe have everyone come up with three rules for a sustainable way of life, have them send in their rules by email, and we can consolidate the similar ones together just as an experiment. The most submitted ones get higher ranking. Cool. A crowdsourced eco-sophie. It'll be an interesting jumping-off point, at the very least. Then we can move on to recent stuff. Maybe throw in some fiction? Eva pulled books from the shelves and started stacking them on her desk. Yeah, like, uh, Ecotopia, or at least parts of it. For sure. And the Monkey Wrench Gang. At least the parts where they discuss the justification for their activities. And save the monkey wrenching for the end? Right, at that point we might bring in some Earth First literature, too. Eric had been leafing through the stack of journals on Eva's desk. Sure, and some of the Liberation Fronts and other organizations? Yeah, but we'll have to draw out the theoretical underpinnings from the direct actions. Maybe we should introduce the idea of political ecology. Oh, you're right. Should we bring that in after Muir? That way we can have a lens through which we can see all this more modern stuff. This is starting to sound like a fun rest of the semester. End of chapter. Chapter 12. 1.5. A Rebuke of Primitivism. Many have romantic ideas about living in balance with nature, like small-scale, aboriginal, and or so-called primitive populations. Modern headlines cry out about uncontacted Amazonian tribes. Note... Science News has a page devoted to these stories, news.sciencemag.org slash tags slash uncontacted dash tribe. End of note. Since the new and old worlds met, Europeans have marveled at the subsistence patterns of native societies. But lest we romanticize pre-colonial populations of North America, remember that 90% of their population had recently died of disease, and they were flush with new technologies, allowing the survivors to live more comfortably in their environments. After the bubonic plague in Europe, the population was also thought to be living in balance with nature, as the reduced population felt less ecological pressure. In both cases, land and resources were suddenly abundant relative to the now smaller populations. A few people engaging in wasteful practices appeared to be living well, and the local environment could absorb their excesses. But if larger populations lived in the same way, the web of resources would collapse. 
We have great trouble grasping the long-term changes of our ecology because we are distracted by the day-to-day nature of our lives. Even on the timescale of the human life, we are rarely around long enough to connect the variables around us. No group has yet developed a perfectly balanced ecological system. Note, see LeBlanc, 2003, pages 17 to 18 and 25 to 26. End of note. As argued by Rand Prior, we must move beyond the dichotomy of civilization versus primitive. Many people believe that civilization and industrialization are wholly positive influences because they have underwritten our current way of life, which is characterized by increasing longevity, a higher standard of living, etc. As the cracks in the facade of our system become increasingly visible, some have reacted by embracing primitivism, or as Prior puts it, quote, This world is hell, this world is civilization, so civilization is hell, so primitive life was heaven. End quote. Note, Prior, 2010, page 119. End of note. They cling to research showing that hunter-gatherers were relatively healthy, peaceful, and egalitarian. Anarcho-primitivists advocate for an active overthrow of our system, while others, such as members of the Dark Mountain, choose to sit back and wait for its self-destruction. Either way, this will result in a return to a simpler world, often with a greatly reduced population. We agree with Prior that we can create a third way forward, one that is neither civilized nor primitive. End of chapter. Chapter 11, Recruiting, Summer 2015. A few months after Lauren first broached the subject of an underground ecological movement, Jason was out weeding in his garden. His phone rang and he scrambled to wipe the clay off his hands in time to answer the call. Hey, is this Jason? asked a friendly man's voice. Yes, uh, who's this? Jason's phone listed the caller's number as unavailable. Uh, I'm a friend of Lauren. She said I'd be in contact with you, right? Jason paused, his face screwed up in confusion. Lauren had been adamant that he'd be contacted face-to-face. Lauren Bloom? Sure, uh, we're friends. What can I do for you? Didn't she tell you? The caller's voice echoed, as if he was on speakerphone. Are you her friend who wanted help with your application to the position you opening up at my school? Jason lied. No, it's about the other thing, the thing you discussed at the book club? Jason paused again. Let's see, we read a different book each month. Can you be more specific? Who is this exactly? Come on, Jason, if you want to be part of this, you need to tell me you know about what this is about. Look, I don't have any idea what the hell you're talking about. Either ask me outright, or I don't think I can help you. Didn't you tell her you'd be interested in joining the group she's in? Jason caught the man's mistake, calling it the group she's in, instead of our group. Jason smirked. What group is that? The League of Women Voters? The group of ecological freedom fighters. Jason had never heard Lauren or any of the others he suspected to be her comrades use the term freedom fighters. It just sounded wrong. This was either the government or a private security person trying to get information out of him. If he admitted that she had brought it up to him, perhaps he could find out exactly who was so interested. But on the other hand, that would confirm the group's existence to the caller. Without more information, he decided to take the safer route. What? That's ridiculous. Lauren's a tree hugger for sure, but I don't think she'd be involved in something like that. Look, if you can't confirm that she invited you to join, we can't let you in. Yeah, all right, I'm hanging up now. Two days later, Jason met Lauren and Eric at a local pub where they played trivia with a group of friends each week. Jason was usually the last to arrive because he knew that Lauren and Eric came early to get a table. Eric's eyebrows raised, his mouth dropped open. Lauren, do mine eyes deceive me? What, did someone mess with your watch? Lauren sat down next to Jason. Jason didn't return their smiles. No, can I talk to you alone, Lauren? The couple exchanged a glance. Did you get a phone call? Eric asked. Jason's surprised look answered his question. Why don't we both sit down? Eric sat down on Jason's other side and pulled out his pocket-sized notebook. So you're in on this too? Jason asked Eric, who nodded. Lauren smiled. Don't look so freaked out. Smile. Act normal. All right now. When did it happen? Was it a man or a woman? Just walk us through it. Jason recounted the call and the details he could remember. He spoke softly amid the din of arriving trivia teams and regulars. Eric took notes, Jason noticed, writing from right to left in a script he didn't recognize. As he wrapped up his account, he asked if others had received similar calls. Lorna and Eric exchanged glances again before she answered. We can't really go into details, but why don't you come over for dinner tomorrow night? Bring your passport, driver's license, and a year's worth of bank statements. Print it out, not on your phone. Birth certificate. I know this sounds weird. A high school yearbook if you have one. For the first time since they arrived, Jason's face lighted up. Uh, okay. Am I being put in witness protection? Eric guffawed. No, of course not. You'll go home with almost all of yourself intact. You know, after we implant the mind control device. Just then, another teammate arrived and cut off their conversation. 
The rest of the night went well, and they would have won if Eric hadn't misspelled the name of actor Brendan Fraser. Jason arrived at Eric and Lauren's house the next evening, just as the setting sun tinted the neighborhood in gold. They cooked, and he brought the beer. Eric met him at the door and asked him to turn off his phone. Because its battery couldn't be removed, it was put in a copper screen bag. Eric started to describe how the Faraday cage blocked signals to or from his phone, but Jason stopped him short, saying he could have saved him some time and money by wrapping the phone in at least three layers of tinfoil. Jason was a science teacher and had taught a class on that topic. Jason was ushered into the dining room, where four others were waiting. He recognized Lauren, but none of the others. Eric introduced them simply as some friends. Dinner was almost ready, and everyone sat at the table, enjoying the salad, quiche, and soup, along with Jason's beer. The conversation was unusually light and kept coming back to Jason. The people he didn't know asked gently probing questions. Where had he gone to high school and college? What social activities did he participate in? What were his hobbies? What type of job did he have? Where had he worked? And so on. The questions were largely innocuous, but everybody was listening intently. When he asked similar questions of them, their answers were vague. As the meal ended, Eric took the documents Jason had brought and distributed them around the table. One man, with glasses and short dark hair, took his passport and excused himself to another room. Jason started to protest, but Eric told him to relax. He was just going to make a call to a friend who worked in Homeland Security to verify the document. Another man and a woman were poring over his bank statements, murmuring quietly to one another. The pages snapped as they turned them. They highlighted a few items, setting those pages aside. The last person whom he did not know was leafing through his yearbook and jotting down notes. At one point, she smirked at him and asked if the other soccer players teased him for being on the chess club, too. Eric cleared the table and started the dishes while Lauren gave Jason a questionnaire to fill out. It was a job application asking about previous employers' addresses, references, as well as more personal information, such as previous relationships, political views, and religious beliefs. As he filled out the form, Lauren took his phone out on the back porch to, as she told Jason, check his call log. Jason finished with the questionnaire as Eric and the man with glasses had returned to the room, giving Jason back his passport. Lauren was also back with Jason's phone off and back in the Faraday cage. Eric told him the fun part was about to start, at which point the two people who had scrutinized his bank statements asked him about certain purchases and deposits in the last year. Later, Eric would tell him that this was to ensure he was not getting cash payments from the government or other entities to spy on them. The man with glasses asked him about various trips abroad based on the stamps in his passport. The yearbook woman said she could contact a few of his friends from high school as well as some of the other people on the questionnaire. Sometimes she would pose as a potential employer looking to corroborate part of his application. In other cases, she would confirm her information through other means. Her favorite, she said, was to call and claim to have found a phone with the contact's number in it, and she was trying to find out how to reach Jason. Eric concluded the short discussion by saying that this was just a precaution to ensure that he was who he said he was, and that he had not been recruited to infiltrate them. Eric assured Jason that this is what every potential new member went through. Before even getting there, the person had to have been known personally to another member for at least two years. They had to be this paranoid because the FBI had a long history of planting agents, from Conan Telpro, which put informants into anti-Vietnam war groups, the Black Panther and movements associated with Dr. Martin Luther King, to infiltration efforts against so-called ecological terror groups, such as the ELF. They hoped, he concluded, that by being paranoid, a fabricated background would collapse. The man with the glasses quipped that it was only paranoia if there was no threat. End of chapter. Chapter 10. 1.4. A Rebuke of Technical Solutions. We pride ourselves on the ingenuity of our society and believe we will be able to think our way out of any problems. James Scott calls this blind faith in technology, quote-unquote, high modernism, described as, quote, a strong, one might even say muscle-bound, version of the self-confidence about scientific and technological progress, the expansion of production, the growing satisfaction of human needs, and the mastery of nature, including human nature, and above all, the rational design of social order commiserate with the scientific understandings of natural laws. End quote. Note. Scott, 1999, page 4. End of note. High modernism is not science. It's the unwavering belief that science will be able to overcome all problems. The largest implementation of high modernism may have been the Soviet and Maoist agricultural reforms of the 1930s and 1950s, respectively. But we have seen the same ideology continue to drive industrial agriculture since the Green Revolution of the 1960s. Even neo-Malthusians, such as Paul Ehrlich and Julian Cribb, cite technological innovation as one way to stave off their predicted famines. Note. Cribb, 2010. Ehrlich, 1968. End of note. High modernism's influence has spread far beyond our food system, though. We all have friends and loved ones who are unworried by a changing climate because of the conviction that scientists will innovate our way out of the coming crisis. 
We'll be able to synthesize food, energy, and the baubles that make life worth living, they say. We'll build seawalls to protect New York, London, and other low-lying metropolises and crank up the air conditioners when Canada and Northern Europe get hot. Who can blame them? The Romans, Egyptians, Mesopotamians, and Maya proudly looked around their cities and felt invincible under the protection of benevolent gods, kings, and priests. Have faith. The gods will save us. We cannot dismiss their beliefs as mere superstition, since our own belief in the infinite power of our technology blinds us to the dangers we have created. Never fear. Science will circumvent any problem. End of chapter. End of episode 5 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com.